Um, I do want to uh, thank particularly uh, a lot of the data I have with stuff that Art did or Art had uh, Jessica do, which is a wonderful thing, and then also uh, uh, certainly Kurt that helped me sort this out and make it, make it, make it right. And already. So um, I, I want you all to think about, and these are the assumptions that I'm making, and see if you can make these same assumptions. And so I'm going to assume we're going to have winner winners. I think that it, we're going to have much more variability. And I, you know, of course, weather, it, that's what you get. You get variability. Um, I believe there's going to be more winter melts. I'm watching Art, making sure is he nodding his head. OK, summer droughts, even though you said not so much, but I think, I think we'll see that. And I think we will see more intense storms. I think that the uh, greenhouse gas emission pressure on animal agriculture Frank, you described it as put up maybe somewhat ill-conceived here in the, new, in, in, in the U.S., but I believe people will be looking at it. And when they look at it, they will look at other things. They will take into consideration the population growth. So one thing they'll say is, wait a minute, we've got to feed all these people. And um, that is, just as you said, a huge ethical issue. Are we going to feed these people? And which people are these? And many of these people are... Sometimes people think, oh, there are other people. Well, do we feed other people? I think, you know, it's, it, we really should be, right? If we look at the world view, we should take that into consideration. So we can't just say, oh, here in the U.S. we have enough. Um, so there will be a commodity demand, I believe. And there will be pressure, though, on animal agriculture. Pressure both to reduce the carbon footprint, perceived, real or perceived, and then also to increase the demand. And by increase the demand, the population is going to want more food, I believe. They're going to look for more meat. As their incomes go up, I think it's pretty clear that they're going to be trying to uh, eat more meat. So we, we, on the one hand, people are going to be looking at us. You're doing it wrong. Uh, you quit doing it. Don't eat meat. And on the other hand, they're going to talk about uh, we, we, we actually need more because everybody wants more. This, uh, Frank, I'm way over here, to say way away from you, this is perhaps one of the ill-conceived studies, but it's one that I read. And basically what they said was that, uh, one, people don't think there's much uh, emissions with agriculture, but there really is. Um, they made it very clear, if you read into this, you know, instead of just looking at the graph, if you read in, they did make it very clear that the efficient production Efficient production really lowers the amount of greenhouse gases, but the actual world production is pretty pitiful for meat, uh, meat production. Their whole point with this, uh, uh, this discussion was, one, the growing population and the need to cut carbon emissions will create a tremendous pressure um, on all these, uh, uh, oh man, where am I going? On all of these, um, but will include uh, how we grow our food. So we, the animal agriculture, uh, our food industry will be under pressure as well. So that's what they said. So um, I believe also because of the greenhouse gas, look, that, that doesn't exclude all the other pressures that are on agriculture. And you can only, you know, we're well aware, right? There certainly are, are uh, water quality issues. There's water quantity issues. Um, I believe that environmental controls on land use will get tougher and tougher. Uh, Europe, if we, if we have any kind of vision at all, we can look over at Europe and we can say, well, it's very likely that'll come here. And it it's, it's, uh, will be an issue for us. The uh, biofuel demand, um, possible, right? There's certainly, a, we're going to need more energy. In New York, we cannot uh, frack to get energy. So what are we going to do? Well, you know, we know what we're going to do. We're going to suck it out of Pennsylvania. We don't, apparently, we don't care how the Pennsylvania people deal with that. <laughs> but uh, th there may be some issues where we'd actually use bio, uh, biofuel. All this, I believe, will mean that we need higher yields, uh, tremendously higher yields on the crop acreage that we have. We made the point already that we really don't want to expand our crop acreage. So we must have higher yields. And of course, that will deal with soil health. And I also believe it will deal tremendously. We'll see water management like you wouldn't believe. Much more irrigation and much more drainage all are coming. Um, I, uh, 
my background includes anaerobic digestion. I have to, uh, I, I, I believe this, that the uh, soon organics will be restricted from landfills. Can't take organics and put them in landfills. What are, what are you going to do with them? And I believe a very efficient thing to do is to mix it with manure and apply those nutrients back on the land. Uh, whether society will do that or not, that's another question, but it could be. I believe that uh, pathogen traceback will be a huge issue going forward. If you look around and we said food safety, our food today here is the safest it's ever been, but that's not enough. We demand ultimate food safety and they're doing tracebacks and they're finding the people that are responsible and they're making them pay. Companies are going out of business and people are actually going to jail because of, we traced it back to you and your farm and your, your company. So that'll become a bigger issue. Um, I believe that we eventually will have to uh, pre-treat our manure before we apply it. And anaerobic digestion is a wonderful precursor to pre-treatment. And of course, it's the double green a greenhouse gas reduction because it reduces the amount of methane, but it also uh, decreases the amount of power that that farm would need. So I, I believe that if we looked at it seriously, we would be supporting anaerobic digestion uh, as we think about the greenhouse gas. Um, I want to look at the short-term impacts and pay most attention to them because these are the ones that happened earliest. I have learned that you know perhaps the best way to do a speech is to only do uh, future predictions way out there. And so I appreciate, Art, how you, you know, here in 2070, and by 2070, well, we will have probably forgotten what you might have said, and <laughs> you can, uh, it, it may come true, and we oh, yeah, but it, it won't matter. That's why it's climate and not weather. Excellent, yep. So, but for short term, I believe that, uh, one, there's going to be more and more restrictions on winter spreading. Um, I believe that eventually people are going to figure out that fall spreading isn't the brightest idea. And I believe that uh, we've already seen that weather variability is going to hit us and that's going to be a real problem. So I believe we're going to end up with more covered storages and those covered storages then will need a solid separation in order to make those work good. And I think we're going to end up with more summer spreading, um, I possibly double cropping because it got a little warmer or we got some species that work better that way. And then, of course, more water management. And water management will have impacts on water quality. And we're here talking about greenhouse gases, but there's a whole lot of effort and emphasis on water quality that will not decline. And in fact, the more we think about greenhouse gases, the more we'll think about better water quality. Um, here's the long-term impacts. Um, I believe there will be treatment systems that deal with all the manure, that you won't just be putting raw manure out on the land. Um, I think uh, also there's going to be a huge need for agricultural professionals, huge need. And I don't see where they're coming from. I don't see it happening. And if we don't have the science that's behind this, we'll end up with policy that may or may not be what we think it ought to be. So we really have to look hard at that. Um, we've, uh, Frank, you've already mentioned the redefinition of sustainable. I think people have to understand that um, we, sustainable means we feed people. Sustainable means that we actually intensify production on the land that we have and do a better and better job of it. I'm not saying what we're doing is perfect, but I think we, uh, we have to define sustainable as different than um, 1950s technology or even, oh, organic farming. I think that's not sustainable in my opinion, which includes, uh, you know, why don't we improve our crops, genetically modified organisms. I believe this is just nuts not to think of making improvements on, on what we want to grow and eat. And that means technology. And of course, I think there will be big issues with insects and weeds uh, going forward. So now let's just talk about storage issues. And when you talk about storage, you need to deal with the management, the design, and then deal with climate change on them. Uh, those of you familiar with this, there's certain percentages that go into this. When you design a manure storage, you've got to put certain volumes in certain places. One of which is, of course, is the precipitation, both the large storms and then the normal precipitation. And of course, we always think that farms do ideal management. And uh, you can read what that is. And we all appreciate ideal management, especially when we're designing it and thinking that that's how it's going to be. And who wouldn't be delighted in having a manure storage uh, surrounded by greenery, this is just wonderful. We can do this uh, uh, maybe in earthen one. 
and uh, having the facility to spread it when we need to spread it. And if you count there, there's at least nine operations there. They're going to empty that manure storage very quickly and get it on the land. Uh, however, we have actual management. And so the size of the manure storage are based on affordability. Um, they aren't emptied when, they, uh, when it comes up. The uh, solids build up or they didn't pump it down completely when they go into the winter season. The drainage area is increased. We have diversions to keep drainage out and we don't maintain that and so we end up with more water coming in. And of course, the manure production increases. You go to every farm and they either have more cows or they have increased production. And what a surprise, when you increase your milk production, you increase your manure production. And it's, it, yeah. Um, so this makes people nervous when they have a manure storage and it gets close to the top. It's, you know, what are we gonna do? Um, sometimes we let it do that, we let it do that, and we have it happen. Or we go out and we have to spread at inopportune times. Um, not so good, maybe an issue. Uh, we get equipment then that's going to work no matter when we uh, want it to go. You know, this will work wonderful. Oh, we can't even drive with the injectors in the ground. So we just dump it down here into the uh, tracks of the equipment and watch it flow down the hill into a waterway. Um, having said all that, uh, Carl, I want to make the point of uh, uh, frost injection. If we freeze the ground a couple inches. And uh, below that is very dry soil because it's, uh, it's, it's come up to form the freezing thing. We inject it. Uh, that is a wonderful way to apply manure. So I don't want to say never, ever put manure out in the wintertime. I think this is actually a very useful way. It may not, though, be a, a way you can count on, but you have to be ready to manage that. So um, people think about manure storages. You have to adapt the design for more, more water. Uh, some people just say, well, give me an extra month. Some people say uh, two times the 25-year storm, we'll have extra freeboard. Some people say, well, we'll do the 10% production increase. Some people do all three. Um, we said uh, we want to do something a little bit uh, more scientific. We do believe that there will be more severe storms, and we do believe that there will be more total precipita precipitation, especially in the wintertime. Um, we did a study, Art, actually Art did a study, and we took advantage of it. Um, where we, we did pay for it, yes. Uh, but we feel like we got our money's worth. It's all, it's all, all a good thing. Um, anyways, we ended up with different uh, rainfall amounts. Um, despite the idea that there's more intense storms, the model that we were using from 1942 to 1960 apparently was a poor model for New York State. Um, also, uh, it had to do also with the, the uh, storm distribution type that we did. Uh, our type two storm was more intense than what was happening. Anyways, typically in it, we're ending up with less. And I'm gonna run through these quick. The one year storm, not much change. The 10 year storm, actually less rainfall with the new model. Um, the 100 year storm, you're starting to see, oh yes, there are increases. So the extreme storms were certainly were more. However, not only is it the amount of rain, but it's the distribution of when it comes and we uh, included that in the model, and when you include that, you get a bit of a spread, you get a tremendous decrease in New York State, um, or most of New York State, when you apply it. And this is typically what conservation practices are designed. So some states didn't like the new New York, we liked it. Oh, this is a wonderful thing. Our, 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 our practices were, were less. However, the 100-year storms, we got different results, and it's, again, more intense. Um, you all are aware of this, that the climate is changing. You've seen this. It's going to be wetter, uh, particularly in the winter. Um, uh, no matter what kind of model you use, you end up with it. Uh, and even during times, during, even now, we're ending up with, uh, we've seen that it's gotten wetter. And certainly farms that manage their manure have noticed this. They have a storage. It's filling up. It's raining on it. It's wet. They have a hard time to go out and spread it because it's wet. It's creating problems. Um, we don't want to talk about that. So uh, one of the things we did in NRCS, we designed it based on the normal runoff. That kind of means average, right? And what, is, what can you tell us about average? Half of it actually is more than that. So we're actually designing these so that half the time they're going to fill up too quick. And uh, we saw that they were filling up too quick, so we decided we would do uh, one thing or another about it. 
Um, I have these slides in here just to show you that evaporation, uh, we don't have much data for evaporation. With climate change, maybe we'll start having more evaporation during the winter period. Uh, typically, as a designer, you don't include evaporation during the winter months, which is the, uh, the, the prime month, so we, we don't have to talk about that. Um, the other thing is, is the statistics that you have, you can't just add up each month and say, well, if we have uh, three years in 10, we'll have more than, and add these up because you'll be adding an unusual event to an unusual event to an unusual event, and so if you add them all up, you really don't know what you got. So instead of doing that, um, these slides, I think we'll just go through, they just prove that there's additional rainfall in the winter, um, particularly starting, um, I think we got one more, um, in, in, the, in the later, later times. So, uh, this is what uh, the Northeast Regional Climate came up with, and what we're doing here is we're saying that 90% of the time you will have less than this rainfall amount. So now when we design a storage in New York State with NRCS, you uh, get the figures off of this, and 90% of the time you won't have more rain than that. And still there's 10% of the time you will have more rain than that, so you still have to manage it, but at least we're not using the averages. So we did it through an October and May period. We also did it through a November and April uh, period. And so instead of, again, using average amounts, we're actually using that, which increase, increases the storage, um, which also, though, increases the cost, right? We're storing more, and so there are cost increases. And you can see that um, at the six-month storage, uh, these, the slope of these are, so this is a actual structure, either concrete or steel. And there's the storage difference. Uh, between 14.7, which was the average, or 19 inches, which was the 90% value. And so uh, using our figures, uh, it's about $500 difference in cost, but you're doing better. That's a good way to get through this fast. I don't know. <laughs> <clears throat> See, I'm not even sure if I did that. I think, you know, it's probably what they did. While he's doing that, I have to tell you, you know, I think a lot of this actually is driven by uh, people with a different agenda, and they, their agenda is don't eat meat. And uh, in true honesty, um, I have a brother who not only is a vegetarian, he's a rawtarian. A rawtarian is you're a vegetarian, but you don't cook anything. And uh, he, him, him and his family did that for, uh, for a number of years. Um, there's also, of course, then those that are fruitarians. And fruitarians, you don't hurt the plant either. You just take what drops. So this would be berries and nuts, you know, what would, what would come off. And so you can go there. Then, of course, you're aware of the aromatarians. They, they just, you get your nutrient by smelling. <laughs> Not too many of those. <laughs> I like to be a fritarian. I like eating free food, it's, a, it's, all, it's all good. Okay, so up in Jefferson County, um, Jefferson County, Doug, you, yep, uh, it's, they get a lot more rain, and so 19.6 uh, was the average, but 27 is the 90%. Um, for the eight months, of course, they're even bigger, and so, sorry, uh, Doug, you gotta pay more, um, uh, certainly as you store, but you'll be happier because you'll actually be able to catch all the water. 90% of the time, you'll be catching it uh, like you're supposed to. Um, the earth and storage with a different slope, and of course, we're going to get different numbers in the Jefferson County the same way. Now, let me make a case for these storage covers. I believe storage covers are an excellent way to go. What does a storage cover do? It reduces the amount of, you're not dependent on the rainfall anymore. You're catching it, keeping it clean, and pumping it off. I think we really should do that. You're also, if you do it right, you're collecting all the greenhouse gases. So I think if USDA was serious, they would be pushing storage covers. I think we heard that from Bill, wherever Bill is. Well, it, you can tell him that I said so. It's all a good thing. Um, you do, though, need to separate the solids out because if you put solids in a covered manure storage, you've got to think how you're going to get those solids out. I think manure storage covers, particularly after anaerobic digestion, would make a lot of sense. I believe there's a lot of anaerobic digestion that occurs after it goes through our digesters that you would also then be catching. It would be a good thing. So storage covers would be a good thing. Uh, catching that water, pumping it out, it's clean water, just fell from the sky, it would be a good thing. 
Uh, Pro Dairy has some information about how much this would cost. Go to their website. Um, it, it varies, right, depending on how much. Uh, certainly the cost of it increases, right, uh, the, the bigger it is. But the savings increase because you're not hauling all that liquid. It costs a lot of money to pick up liquid and haul it out to the fields. So you are actually saving right there. And you're separating the solids out. When you separate the solids out, you're also saving uh, the, the, uh, the storage volume. So that would be a good thing. And then there may be uses for those separated solids that you could take advantage of. I believe we're going to be pushing more and more towards summer spreading. Um, I believe we'll do it, should be doing it. A lot of our designs and everything, the, the comprehensive nutrient management plan says do this after, uh, uh, spread it in the summer after hay cuttings. A lot of our farmers go out and do that and then they find out they're not going to do that. The neighbors object. What a surprise. And so then they're kind of left, oh, when shall I spread? And now they're in the fall and the winter spreading and so it's not so good. Um, I think spreading on growing crops is a wonderful thing. I think double cropping would be a wonderful opportunity if we could figure out how to do that. I believe uh, we have some, uh, the weather issues that we've experienced where we have uh, cold, no snow spread, and then a melt. And so the melt comes on frozen ground. We're very embarrassing for us this uh, two years ago. Um, so embarrassing that uh, DEC, bless their hearts, has said that we will have some more issues here with winter spreading here in New York. We're going to put it under control. And you can only imagine, you see the temperatures there, and then the rainfall event hits, and it really, it, it, it did look bad. Our last winter was really tough, and in that winter we had concrete frost to significant depth. It really changes what you think happens to manure when you spread it in the winter, because if the melt happens from the top down, then it's going to run off. Um, if you don't have much frost in the ground, the melt happens from the bottom up and it'll soak in. Uh, we have a lot of aquifers we want to protect. We have uh, groundwater issues with limestone that we have to deal with. So let's figure out ways to uh, incorporate the manure during the summer. And in Europe they have ways. This is a, a mechanism that people have been doing here to uh, incorporate that manure. Uh, one, it reduces the odor. Uh, two, it would have an I impact on some emissions. And then I think, Doug, sometime you're going to talk about this mechanism, which is a nutrient boom. I think this is a wonderful idea to be able to put. What a surprise are nutrients on crops, on a growing crops when they need it. The challenge will be is let's make sure that we can do this. Um, and this is the fertilizer, not that we fertilize first and then, oh, we'll put this out uh, uh, otherwise. This, I think, is the third generation. We have great hopes. I have great hopes. Doug, I think you have great hopes that this will be a, a useful thing uh, for farms to put it out in the summer. Um, I believe that water management will be much more of an issue, and it relates to greenhouse uh, uh, gas, particularly in the drainage uh, portion of it. Um, as we work for more intensive agriculture to get more production on the land that we got, uh, we will be in installing uh, uh, irrigation systems, dealing with some of the drought issues. Uh, we'll also have to deal with drainage. We have to do outlet control. Um, and I think there are impacts with uh, nitrous oxide as we do this as well. So well, there'll be more irrigation. Um, this is a real old photo, but this, is, this looks like a lot of the corn ground around here because of the wet spring that we had. And so I believe there'll be tremendous more drainage going in and then uh, over time, I think we'll see uh, a, a lot of irrigation in New York even. And of course, you all know that stuff moves through the soil. And when it moves through the soil, it comes out the tile in somewhat disgusting ways. And people will be interested in that. So uh, drainage management will help after the harvest. Block it off. Let the soil absorb more of the nutrients. Don't let it run out during the growing season. You can manage it. You can work it. And then, of course, the uh, bio... Uh, reactors that uh, through carbon uh, in here will actually absorb some of the nitrogen and perhaps some of the phosphorus before it, it outlets. So picture the scene, every tile that you got will have to go through some kind of mechanism like this to control the nutrients, turning it from non-point to a point source. But uh, I think if, we're, if we really want to improve and think of the, uh, uh, all the stuff that goes down the Mississippi and uh, Erie. Who's here from Ohio? Got to be, oh, well. So in Ohio, 
they have, you know, they shut down the water supply, right? Because, and why? It's, it's actually, it's coming from the farmland and from the tile. So we can only anticipate this going on. I want to emphasize, though, that I think anaerobic digestion has some tremendous advantages in all these systems. Uh, the odor control, oh, we can spread this in the summertime when it might be needed. Uh, the pathogen uh, uh, control also is a good thing. And of course, it's, it's a deep green uh, mechanism. So it also then very likely would be a precursor to other, uh, other treatment processes, which then could become very, very uh, useful to us. Um, here's another issue that I think is um, what a surprise. The more nitrogen we put on, uh, the higher our yield, the more uh, nitrous oxide emissions we end up with. Who's going to solve that problem? And so again, I think that might be uh, some technology. So my conclusions are climate is changing. The storage needs to increase. So and in think about this, not only to get through the winter, but probably even to get through the fall. Um, risk management uh, coverage would help. Having the option to spread in the summer. Uh, there'll be more water management. Uh, I believe there'll be more treatment. There needs to be more technology. Those of you that are researchers, this is, this is job, you know, this is uh, job security uh, uh, for that. And my one hope is that the technology actually does come before the policy, although I've never seen that, actually. Um, and then if there's time for questions or not.